Hello Church, now I am going to re-record today's message for you because we had a few technical difficulties at church, the recording didn't work. But before I talk to you about the message for today, I just want to tell you about the service we had. Today we was able to worship, to worship out loud together where everybody could sing out loud and it sounded glorious. So let me encourage you, if you haven't yet been back to church, um, especially now that restrictions have lifted yet again, that you come, come and be part of something that is just so amazing and it just sounds so brilliant because our praise is going up to heaven and it was a glorious morning. We also had a financial report from Alan um, who told us how the church is doing financially and where our money is going. We are going to be putting the slides out to that report out on our email. So if you'd like to see it, but you're not on our emails, then if you let us know your email address and we will send you the slide report so you can see how we're doing financially. But the biggest thing we want to say is thank you. Thank you. We are in a good place as a church and it's because of you. It's because of your faithful giving, even after the year we've had, even we've not been able to be in the building you've carried on tithing, you've carried on giving to the work of God and we are seeing the fruit of it now. So we just want to say a huge thank you. Thank you to everybody for being so faithful, for just being so wonderful throughout this time that we can now declare as a church that we are in a good financial place and it's because of you. So thank you very much. Now today's message of course is carrying on on our theme where Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. And as we are sort of coming to um, the end of this series, I want to ask you, how confident are you in that statement? That the church is victorious, that the church you know, is what Jesus himself has built and that it will withstand everything. Now, back in 2001, the leader of the Catholic Church in England and Wales was at a conference and he made the statement that Christianity is vanishing in the UK. This caused the BBC to do a BBC talking point on it about is the church still relevant? Is Christianity still relevant? And they did it online where people could then put in their votes and put any comments they would like. And these are some of the comments that we um, looked at when I was looking at this survey that the BBC did. So people made comments such as, it would be great if we could all, sorry, it would be great if we could all be how God wants us to be, but it's never going to happen. One or two rules to live by is good, but the Bible promotes thousands, and if breaking even one of those rules means eternal damnation, then we're all going to hell for sure. Why follow rules you don't believe in? Seems to me like Christianity in the church is creating an unnecessary straitjacket. There's somebody that needs to hear about grace and forgiveness. Another person wrote, Christianity is and always will be entirely relevant. Whether human beings choose to believe so or not, God revealed in Jesus Christ the ultimate reality. What we believe about him, it doesn't change that. Any more than what we believe about gravity changes the law of physics. Human beings have always fought against God and in the end, God of course will win. But in Jesus, God has given us the opportunity to change sides and join him. That is the relevance of Christianity. Another person wrote, Long sermons, so often full of nonsense, hold no promise for enriching our lives. Change with the times and the people will follow. Somebody else said, and I haven't checked this out for myself, but I really hope it's true. They said that Voltaire said that in 50 years, Christianity would be dead. A hundred years after his death, the French Bible Society used his house to print Bibles. Be careful what you say. I really hope that one's true. Another person wrote, if you're educated enough to think for yourself, why would you need a church to tell you what to think? And these comments carried on and on, some in favour of the church and how relevant it is, and some saying that the church is outdated, out of time and has no relevance anymore. Now there was 4,629 people that took part in this discussion, and they had to make a vote. Is the church, is Christianity relevant? The results were that 57% said the church was still relevant, that Christianity was still relevant, and 43% said that it was not. So that means we won! 
on that poll we got it we won that the church is still relevant but now in 2021 what are people's view is the church still relevant is christianity what we believe in is it still relevant in today's day and age because what is it that we that you and me are living out in this world now i reckon if you're tuning in today or if you was in church today that you know there's a good chance that you do believe church is relevant and that's why you're tuning in and it's why you're spending your time this way and i commend you for it but is that what we're living out is that what we are showing the rest of this world now joshua in the bible he was called to lead at a very hard time because you see when joshua was asked to lead he was asked to take God's people, God's church, into the promised land. But there was a problem because this had also been asked like nearly 40 years prior to Joshua coming into power because when Moses was leading the Israelites, when he was leading God's people, again God said, yeah, I want you to go into the land that I'm going to give you. So Moses sent out 12 spies to look at this land. All 12 spies came back and said how glorious this land was, how magnificent it was. And it's just like mind blowing, amazing. But then 10 of them used the word, but, but, but there are giants, but it's going to be a challenge, but it's hard, but we're not equipped enough, but we can't do it. But the timing's not right. And they started speaking negatively. They forgot the size of their God. They forgot the one that was telling them to go. And they started looking at the situation they saw. They started looking at the physical and said, we cannot do it. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, they saw the hardship. They saw the giants, but they also remembered who was calling them to go into that land. So they said, yes, we can do it. But Moses, he listened to the 10. He listened to the 10 that said, we can't, that it's impossible, that we cannot make a difference. We cannot go in and take that land. He listened to them and said, the timing's not right. So God, because of their disbelief, said, now none of you that disbelieved will come into the promised land. But he protected Joshua and Caleb, the two that said they could. And as the generations then arose up and obviously new generations coming in, he kept Joshua and Caleb so that they could go into the promised land. And now nearly 40 years on, that time has come for them to go into that promised land. The land that was deemed too hard to get. The land that we, they were told that was just impossible to overcome all the obstacles that the, that land was going to throw at them. But now they've been told to go. And church, I feel is the same for us. That when we look out in the world, it can seem like an impossible land. It's too hard. It's too grey. There's no boundaries like we used to have. There's not a direct right and wrong, but there's this grey image. There's all these things going on in this world that makes the church seem irrelevant, out of touch, out of time. And, and we can look and we can say, but how can we overcome this? How can we overcome what is happening in the world at the moment? How can we overcome the attitudes that are in the world? It's just too hard. It's too impossible. We can't do it. We're not equipped enough. And we can start sounding like those 10 spies. But God is calling Joshua to now go into that land. And I believe he's calling us now to rise up confident in the church, confident in the victory we have in the church as we rise up and go forward and we do make a difference knowing that God has called us. So today we are going to look at Joshua when he is first called by God and what God says to him so that he can rise up and go forward. And we're going to look at these lessons and we're going to take them upon ourselves for 2021 as we rise up as a church and go into all that God has got for us. So first, let's read it. We're going to be reading from Joshua 1, verses 1 to 11, where it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon, for, from the great river of Ephraites, to the Hitti country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. 
Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the laws my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn it from, do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the, tell the people, get all your provisions ready. Three days from now, we will cross the Jordan from here and go in there to take the possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your very own. So here we've got Joshua being called, called to go forward, called to take God's people into a land that was deemed too impossible to go to. And as God calls him, he gives him three assurances. Three assurances that he gives to us today. Those assurances are assurance one, the assurance that God has got a plan. Two, the assurance of being prosperous and successful. And three, the assurance that God is with us. So first, let's look at the first insurance, the assurance that God has a plan. In verse six, we read, be bold and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Right at the beginning, God is declaring a plan. He has a plan. He knows what he wants to happen. And he is telling Joshua, this is what's going to happen. And it's not a plan he just thought up. It wasn't something he thought he woke up that day and thought, oh, this would be a nice idea. But it's a plan that he had in place, a plan that he's fully equipped his people to do. Because you see, if we read Genesis 15 verses 18 to 21, that's Genesis 15 verses 18 to 21, we can read God talking to Abraham, where he gives him the same promise about having a land that you can call your own. So in Genesis 15, starting at verse 18, it says, On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants, I give you this land, from the radio of Egypt to the great river, to the Ephraites, the land of the Kenites, Kesheus, Kemar, and the list goes on to a lot of things I can't pronounce, but the list goes on to all this land that now they're talking about Joshua and his people actually going in and claiming. Because you see, Joshua was part of something bigger than him. He was part of God's plans. And they are bigger than what you and me could ever comprehend. Because God's plans are, oh, they're mighty. God's plans are to bring greatness and bigness into our lives. God had a plan 400 years prior to Joshua ever hearing about it. But you see, God will always complete his plans. He is a God of completion. In Psalm 33 verse 11, it says, The plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purpose of his heart through all generations. Be assured, God has a plan and he calls you to be part of it. In Ephesians 2 verse 10, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's prepared us in advance to do. He's already equipped us. So we need to be able to declare that the church is victorious, that we are confident in this statement, that we choose to speak it out, to live it out, with the assurance that God has got a plan. He knows what he is doing. So we can move forward in the assurance that it's God's plans that we are fulfilling. The second assurance that God gave Joshua was the assurance of being prosperous and successful. In verse seven, we read, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the laws my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. God has already determined the outcome, an outcome of success, an outcome of being prosperous. And he says how to do it in verse eight, if we carry on reading, keep the book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you can be careful to do everything written in it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. God has equipped us he gave us this. He gave us the Bible. This is my Bible. And in this is everything we need. It's the encouragement we need, the guidance we need. And when we truly get into this, when we truly 
um, spend time, not just on a Sunday, but throughout our lives, daily. We open our Bibles because God doesn't want to speak to us weekly. He wants to speak to us daily. He wants to speak to us in the moment. And he says, listen, I've given you all that you need. So let's make sure that we are people that are opening our Bibles, that we're hearing what God's got to say, that we're taking his encouragement, we're taking his strength. In Psalm 119, verse 5, it says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light to my path. In Psalm 1, verse 23, sorry, in Psalm 1, verse 2 to 3, it says, But those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditate on that law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by a stream of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaves does not wither, whatever they do, prosperous. We need to be people that are in our Bibles, hearing what God is saying. Know the power you speak when you speak out the words of God. So Joshua is given the assurance that God has got a plan. He's given the assurance of being successful and prosperous. The same assurances that you and me have today. And then the third assurance was the assurance that God is with us. The assurance of God's presence with us. In verse 9 we read, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God knows. He knew the journey in front of Joshua. He knew how hard it could be. He knew mentally how hard it would be. He knew how physically hard it would be. And yet he says to him right at the beginning, wherever you go, I am with you. What an encouragement. That is a great encouragement to help spur us on that no matter what this world throws at us, that God is with us. This isn't the first time that God says this to Joshua. If we jump back to verse 5, we read, As I was with Moses, I will also be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forget you, God says. I'm right there with you. God says it in verse 5. He then repeats it in verse 9 because he knows it's something that needs repeating. Because Joshua needed to understand this. He needed to get the fact that God is with him. Therefore, he can rise up boldly. He can rise up courageously because God is with him. And today it's the same for you and me. We can rise up with boldness. We can rise up courageously because God is with us. Now in Romans 8 verse 31 to 39, we read, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or prosecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all, these, all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Hear that today. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing, nothing can separate us from God because he is right there with us. In all seasons, if things are glorious, he is there rejoicing with us. If things are tough and hard, he is there with us, holding us up. He is constantly with us, never going to leave us, never going to forget us. Wherever we tread, he goes with us. You have the assurance today that you're not alone, that God himself is with you and there's nothing that can separate you. Therefore, rise up boldly and courageously. At the beginning of every one of these insurances that we've looked at today, it starts with be bold and courageous. Be bold and courageous. And we can be bold, we can be courageous because we have the assurance, the assurance that God has got a plan, the assurance that we will be prosperous and successful, the assurance that God is with us. 
Therefore, let's rise up in boldness. Let's rise up courageously, no matter what we see in this world, no matter how this world might try to tell us that it is um, too strong and it can overpower us. It cannot, because we are told that Jesus is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Therefore, we have the victory. Therefore, we can go because God has got a plan, because God will give us the victory and because God is there with us. Now, this week I was reading about confidence in children and I read this statement where it says, confidence helps us feel ready for life's experiences. When we're confident, we're more likely to move forward with people and opportunities and not back away from them. And if things don't work out at first, confidence helps us to try again. Church, we need to be confident in the church, confident in what Jesus has built when he put the church together, when he works on his people, when he works on the church, in what he's doing, that's where our confidence needs to be. So that when time comes, when hardship comes, or when trials come, or when confusion comes, or when discouragement comes, that we can still rise up boldly and courageously because we know, we know that God has got a plan. We know that we will be prosperous, that we will be victorious in this. And we know that God is with us. So we can rise up boldly. We can rise up with courageous hearts, knowing that God has gone before us. Now, at the beginning, I shared about the talking point that the BBC did, where it's talking about is the church and Christianity still relevant? And I want to finish today by reading another comment that I read in that, where somebody wrote, There is nothing more boring than sitting in a cold, damp church, listening to a vicar or priest rambling on about how awful and sinful we are. What churches need is dynamic personalities going out into the community and actually getting involved with the people. Now we promise as we bring the message that we will do our best not to ramble on if you promise that you will rise up, that you will rise up boldly and courageously, that you will be those dynamic personalities because it's what God has put in you and you will go out into the community and you will show them, you will show them the power of God's family, the power of church, the victorious church. So that when people are asked, is the church relevant? Is Christianity, what we believe, relevant in 2021? They will say confidently, yes, yes it is. Because they will think about you. They will think about the example you have set. About the words you have spoken out. And they will say, yes, the church is relevant. Because us, as God's children, we choose to live it out. And we live it out boldly and courageously with the assurance that God has got a plan, with the assurance that we will be prosperous, that we will be victorious in it, and with the assurance that God is always, always with us. So church, let's rise up boldly and courageously as we move forward. Have a fantastic week. Don't forget to check out the weekly um, email to see all the activities that's happening in August that we hope to see you at. But church, you are mighty, you are victorious, and we just need to now rise up boldly and courageously and show this world just how powerful our God is. Have a mighty week, be blessed, and we hopefully see you soon. Bye.